Hi, I'm Debbie Montgomery Johnson, founder of the nonprofit, The Woman Behind the Smile, and your host of Stand Up and Speak Up, a show that is about each and every one of us. Many of us have something, something we're hiding, something we're ashamed of, something that through no fault of our own or through our own making, we keep hidden, and that in turn keeps us hidden from each other and the world. Good people go through terrible situations. Wise people know when and how to let it go. Everything that happens to us helps us grow, and while it may be hard to see it right away, the most important thing to do is to change your perception about your circumstances. Regardless of what your personal experiences or traumas have been, this showcase series is designed to ignite the light in you, as well as providing safe harbor, education, personal growth, and resources, so that no matter where you are on your journey, you'll have the courage to move on when you're ready. Stand Up and Speak Up features ordinary people who've been through extraordinary situations and struggles and then found the courage to step out from behind their smiles and speak up about their experiences and the lessons gleaned from those experiences. Everybody heals at a different pace, and we recognize that. So come on in, have a listen, and enjoy the ride at your own speed. It's a beautiful day in paradise, and I say that for my Canadian friends who haven't been on recently because I found out that it costs them money to listen to our free show. So we got to do, do something about our, uh, about our Canadian connection because it's a fun show and Stand Up and Speak Up today is, today is a special show again for me. I, I had an hour with my mom two weeks ago, which was extraordinary. And the, one of the best things for me about doing this show in this format is when we, sh- when we sh- saw the replay on YouTube, I showed my younger brothers the show with mom, and they sat there with my dad, and it was so much fun to watch their reaction to some of the answers mom gave, because I live around her, and I hear these stories all the time, but my brothers did not hear some of the stories, and that is probably what's going to happen today, because my special guest today is a man I've been researching my entire life, (laughs) and have worked with my entire life. And I bet all of these questions that I have to ask him today, I might know a portion of the answers. So we're going to jump right into it. So Dr. Jack Butts, known as Dad, are you here with me today? Most of me is. (laughs) Oh, I can see this is going to be a great show. (laughs) Okay. Everything everything about my mind, that's okay. Okay, well, speak loud, Pop, because I know you got your hearing aids in and you can hear me, but I want everybody to hear you, okay? Okay. All right, all so right. the way I start the show, Dad, and you know this, you've listened to most of all, most all of them, is I yeah. go back to background and, your, okay. and your, your beginnings, and your beginnings started in 1929, so we're going back a long way. Could you yeah, please tell me? Yeah, it was a time for the world. <laughs> Can you please tell me a little bit about you growing up and your family? Yeah, well, let's see. I think I was an orphan, but I don't remember for sure. Uh, No, I guess I wasn't. I was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, at a hospital called Women's, Philadelphia Women's Hospital, which I think they don't ever have any men there. So you can't go there as a man and have a baby. So it's it's only uh, the women's hospital, and I was born there on September 15th, 1929. Never went back to it again. Uh, It's on Broad Street, I think, in Philadelphia, if anybody knows Philly. And uh, then we lived in West Philadelphia for the next, uh, until I was in third grade. Then we moved out to the suburbs of Philadelphia. What town was that? Was that with Drexel Hill? Upper Darby, Drexel Hill. Drexel Hill is part of Upper Darby. Upper Darby is a suburb of uh, Philadelphia. Okay. And you lived with your mom and dad, and you had a little sister? Tell me about your little sister. Yeah, I had a little sister, Peg. Uh, I was Jackie, and she was Peggy. And um, she was just a year and a half younger than me. And uh, unfortunately, she just died uh, last month. But she had a tough tough five or ten years of Alzheimer's. And uh, I haven't had that yet. I'm not going to get it either. 
Nope, you're not. So let's go back. So you are gonna, we're going to test you on your Alzheimer's today, Pop. When you were young, what is your favorite memory of you and Peggy? The fact that we never argued. Oh, wow. <laughs> no, we never had a fight. Never had a, never had a bad word, I don't recall. Uh, she was away a lot. Um, she went away to school, to college when I stayed home. And uh, so we didn't see a lot of each other. She she did she wasn't into sports, which I was very much into. So I was going most of my spare time. I was going playing games, and she uh, she had her dolls to play with, and she loved she loved ice skating. Uh, not that she was a great skater, but she just loved watching it. And uh, I can't I don't remember too much about our younger life because we never saw each other that much. And then when she went away to college, then shortly after that she was married. Uh, we did spend, uh, Gwen and I had our honeymoon up at State College, Pennsylvania, which is where Peggy went to went to work as a school teacher and also as a dental assistant. Okay, well let's go back, let's go back. If you can remember, and I know it's hard because I'm trying to remember even when I was a kid, what was your favorite thing to do when you were little? When you would go on a vacation with your mom and dad when you were little, where would you go and what was your favorite thing? Yep. Well, we always went down to Ocean City, New Jersey, which is probably about 60 miles from Philadelphia on the Atlantic Ocean. Very popular uh, resort. Uh, nice beaches, and of course the ocean was there. <clears throat> my, my dad loved to fish, so uh, that was the one thing that I did do with him. Although you can, when you're fishing, you're usually just standing there talking to the fish, and <laughs> that's about that's about all. But uh, I would often go up and down the beach. Of course, I love to throw seashells into the ocean, uh, big big clam shells, uh, which I guess brought about my love for throwing stuff. Um, I love to throw. Baseball, any kind of ball or discus or shot put or any, anything that you're supposed to throw, I enjoyed that. And uh, I used to, we used to dig, my sister and I, she used to help me, we'd, we'd dig uh, big holes in the sand and pretend they were automobiles, which is kind of crazy. But to put them down about three feet and climb down into them and then think you're driving along the beach. And that was that was fun. The fishing, the fishing was fun, but uh, unfortunately, ocean fishing is a little bit boring until you caught a shark. <laughs> then, if you caught a shark, it was a little more exciting. And uh, they had other other fish called robins, sea robins. We call them sea robins because they chirp. And the fun when we caught them, and we caught uh, flounders and other white fish croakers. They call it croakers. Call them croakers because they croak. And uh, like frogs, and uh, usually the beach was not very crowded. Fortunately, um, I used to go along that same beach later on in life when the war came, 1940s. When we we were there in the 30s, in the 40s the war came and messed up the whole beach. The New Jersey shoreline was noted for sunken ships, the German submarines before we figured it out. They had a all. Oh, they had a field day there, sinking ships one after the other, and the sinking ships or sunken ships would give up all their oil, and then the oil would come and just mess up the ocean terribly, mess up the beach. You could hardly walk on the beach because of the tar and the oil and the other stuff. The fun thing about that was uh, that the the uh, navy used to send shore patrols along the beach every day so from even from the time i was a very little kid i always had a thing about the navy and the army i loved the military and i'm not sure why at that time because nobody in the family at that time this is before the second world war uh, nobody in the family had been in the military for a while and um, i don't know i just i just loved the military i had i had a must i had 50 or 100 toy soldiers and this is hard to believe these days, but in, back in those days, they used to buy lead and melt it in special little uh, container that were heated, melt the lead and pour them into molds and make make yourself soldiers. 
lead soldiers. And uh, they're about maybe two or three inches high. Now, I can't imagine anybody allowing their children to play with lead these days. <laughs> they, wouldn't, they wouldn't make it till they were 12. But anyway, um, that was fun, and it was inexpensive. And then uh, that's mainly what we did on the beach. It was too, spend- too, little, too little to play volleyball or any of that kind of stuff. Did you spend much time talking with your, like your dad or your mom? Did they go in the water? I, I don't recall Grandma ever being at the beach, but no, grandma- except for the fishing. Yeah, dad, dad would stand. He would stand in the ocean for hours on end, and that's why he liked it because nobody would bother him. My father was uh, uh, kind of funny in that way, and he was a very uh, singular person. He, he 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 loved to be by himself more than company. Not that he couldn't be sociable. He was a wonderful bridge player because he was an extremely smart man. But he was a chemical engineer, and he just liked to think on his own. In fact, I remember one one time when a, a gentleman came down to the beach to talk to my dad about business. Dad used to come down on weekends from the city. And uh, we go down, and I never saw my father that much in bathing suits. He usually had on khaki pants and an old shirt. But anyway, this guy came down to the beach in a full suit. And I said, this is weird. I've never seen a guy on the beach in a full suit. Anyway, it turns out this is one of his, one of his chemical engineering buddies who turned out to be president of a, a very large company, chemical company in Philadelphia. Also was a trustee at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, which... I didn't know that at the time. I don't think he got me into school there, but that's where I went to school. Yep. So, so Grandpa was pretty quiet. What, what is the one thing you think you remember about Grandma and Grandpa's relationship? Well, I know that uh, we, I found a diary when he died. Uh, found a diary that he had made day by day. He was meticulous in his uh, keeping records. In fact, he had a wonderful secretary, Dorothy Erickson, beautiful blonde. He loved blondes. And she was his secretary, and he would not even give dictation to her. He had to always write out everything that he did by hand, in longhand, and then she could type it. But he would not accept anybody taking any dictation from him. He would he would just write it out himself, and everything he did. I used to love to have him make me drawings of anything, you know, tanks and ships and all the military things, and they were beautifully detailed, very accurate, and that's just the way he was. He, that's in his business, he was what they called a patent attorney, which meant that he was the man who, if anybody had a patent in the company. Of course, he worked for Atlantic Refining Oil, which is one of the largest oil companies in the world. And he worked for them, and any time anybody had a patent, uh, they would bring it to him, and then he would go to Washington, D.C., and research the patent and make sure that it hadn't been done before and all the other stuff you have to do. So everything had to be perfect. There was no opportunities for mistakes. And uh, that's the way he worked. And... The other fun thing I always remember about Dorothy, his secretary, was that she used to say to me, everybody used to say, well, when your father has says something, make, make sure you listen because it's important. He did, he did never talk about nothing, <laughs> so to speak. And so anything, anything he had to say was uh, worth listening to. And that's good. I often regret the fact that I didn't sit down and talk with him more because, uh, of course, he had his first heart attack when uh, he was only 38 years old and uh, died of a heart attack at age 46. And uh, at that time, I was only 19, and they, I, was, I was living at home. But uh, he, he went to work early in the morning, came home late at night, and on the weekends, he would be gone doing his favorite avocation, which was shooting. He was he was a U.S. championship marksman and we had we had a ton of guns in the house and I had my first gun when I was six years old some people might not like that idea but uh, in my day having a gun was very important and still is and uh, I respect them and people like me don't go around shooting people so uh, that's one thing I learned early in life 
And um, so I used to enjoy shooting with him, but then he'd take me out. He was uh, what they call the gun the gun range master at the Atlantic Refining Gun Club, and he used to take me there on Saturday mornings. But talk about boring and hot. We were down in the uh, where all the storage tanks are for oil. These humongous tanks, surrounded by big gravel mountains, almost around them, to in case the, they had a leak in the tanks, they would they would just stay in that little reservoir. But anyway, they had the, the shooting range right next to them, and uh, it was you know you shoot a bunch of shots, then we go out. To where the targets were, and uh, when we were done shooting, we would go with a, a little shovel and dig all the lead out of the banks behind the targets, and then we'd use that lead to make more bullets. So we just kind of it was a cycle: shoot them, dig them up, melt them down, make more, shoot them, <laughs> and so forth. So in our basement. We had, uh, it was amazing because he had these connections since he had, he also was uh, in charge of another private shooting range nearby our house. And he had an arrangement whereby he was very close friends with an army major in Frankfurt Arsenal in Philadelphia, which may still be one of the largest arsenals that the army has. And this guy became very, very well acquainted with dad. And he used to give him bullets you know, extra bullets that they had, and wish they had millions of them. And he'd give them tons. And when Dad died, we had, I would say we had approximately, eh, I'd say 2,000 bullets in our basement. <laughs> he, uh, he he did that. And then the only amazing thing, I, when Dad died, uh, we were, he, he didn't have much insurance, and he had had a very good job, but he was only, you know, 46 years old. So we hadn't had time to accumulate a lot. We had a nice house. But anyway, um, his guns were his prized possessions. And I, unfortunately, I, going to school, it was so expensive that I had to sell, I had to sell practically everything that I had. I sold my stamp collection. I sold all my photographic equipment. I sold uh, uh, half of his guns, which I wish I had never done. Because there's one one gun in particular that I sold for probably fifty bucks. I understand it's now worth six thousand hmm. dollars because the, the guns don't lose their value. Anyway, um, that's what we used to do, and then make make the bullets in the basement of the house, which was kind of fun. So that's, one that's what, yeah. one thing you said at the beginning, Dad, is that you found a diary that yeah. Grandpa wrote oh, yeah. to Grandma. Can you? Yeah. Right. Tell me a little bit about yeah, that. I got, I got distracted there. Yeah, the diary was a day-by-day uh, listing of all of the dates that he and Mom had. And he even had little X's and little circles. And the X's would have been, I guess, a kiss, a circle was a hug. And Mom had the most beautiful light blue eyes, which everybody used to always remark about. And his name for her was, uh, her, was her beautiful little blue eyes, I guess. And uh, is that what it was? I think it was. Anyway, uh, that's what she was known for. And uh, his day, it was funny because he, he would write and he said, oh, oh, Lillums is what he, her name was Lillian. He called her Lillian, Lillums. And he would write in, Lillums gave me a hug today. Great Aww. day. <laughs> and Cynthia has that book now. Okay. She came across it and she thought it was great, and so I gave it to her. And uh, whenever he gave her a gift of any kind, he would write it down. Or if they had a date, uh, he would write down the date. And it was funny because uh, Grampy was, uh, that is his father, was an MD who had come off the farm back in the old days in Pennsylvania. Came off a Pennsylvania Dutch farm, went to Philadelphia, became a pharmacist, had a drugstore for a year or two, and then decided to go to medical school. So then he went to medical school at Penn, uh, where I had gone and where my dad had gone, and uh, used to make all his own medicines right in his office uh, in the city, which you could never have that happen today. Can you imagine? 
doctors making their own medicine. <laughs> so anyway, that that was uh, that was fun. Also, Dad had a shooting range down in the basement of the house, which happened to be right underneath the waiting room for my his father's office. And people used to hear the shooting down in the basement, wonder what the heck was going on. <laughs> I could so scare anyway, off yeah. some patients. Uh, I said that could scare off some patients. Yeah, well, if they were sick enough, they wouldn't care. But anyway, it's uh, just one of those crazy things that happened. So Grandpa Butts died um, young, very young, and you were 19. Aunt Peg was probably about 17. Uh, how did Grandma survive after that? Did you help her out a lot, or was she working? Yeah, she, uh, she was working in a... <clears throat> department store about five miles away, which is the same place that I ended up working when I was in college. And also your mom ended up working there too, called Lit Brothers, which was a department store, like like a Macy's, a large department store. And so she worked there. I, I often marvel as I think back about her, because I lived with her until I was completely through school. And... Um, I live with her, and I just don't know how she ever managed to do what she did, because she was working. Uh, then later on, she had to take care of my father, and then when he died, he had in those days, I think they had ten thousand dollars worth of insurance, which at that time was considered a bunch. That was in 1950. Anyway, and then um, her mother had came to live with us. So there was her mother, and then my grandfather had two sisters who lived with him in the, in the city in his office, uh, or his house, but his office. And uh, he had two sisters who lived there who didn't do anything but sit around. Uh, they were nice, but they didn't do anything. And uh, so my dad had promised uh, his father that if anything happened to his father, that he would take care of his sister. So he invited her to live at our house along with my mother's mother and then my sister and then me and then one of my sister's girlfriend's parents, he was in the oil business, um, he used to travel a lot and lived in Europe a lot. So they, they used to live in Europe most of the time and so we invited his, their daughter, Trudy, to live with us also. So there was another... <laughs> Another girl in the house. So anyway, mom would work, and she never in my lifetime do I ever remember her complaining about anything. She just did everything, and uh, she was, well, of course, you're, everybody loves her mom, but she was an extraordinary woman. I never saw her, as I told mom, I never saw her angry. I never saw her yell at anybody. All she ever did was take care of people. And she was a fun-loving, blue-eyed, lovely lady. She I was a sweetheart. She, she was yeah, a she sweetheart. Was. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, but she moved to uh, moved to Arizona because she couldn't she couldn't come to Vermont. It was too slippery up there for her. She broke her leg already once, and so she said, "No, I think uh, if I have to live with any of you kids, I'll live nearby your sister who lived in Arizona." So she went and bought a condo out there, and that's where she died. She did. She had some of the funniest stories because she actually ended up having a gentleman friend, and his name was, I only called him Uncle Bill. Uh -huh. and, and they used to travel. Bill oh, yeah, would take Bill Grandma was... to great trips. Oh, yeah, all through Europe, Scandinavia. Uh, I can't remember they went to the Philippines. They, they did a lot of traveling. Yeah. Yeah, he, he was a great guy. Was well, that was guy. nice that he was able to take care of her um, after you because I know you did a lot. So, Pop, um, one thing, I mean, you're 92 now, and, and we're going to do a lightning round because I wanted to go back to, you know, you probably never real, uh, never expected to live past 50. So that a lot of things that you did and, and thought about um, because of your Pop dying early sure. uh might have limited you to, to many things. But let's do a lightning round here. This is a little different. I didn't do this with mom. And these are short questions, short answers. And then we'll get more into the stories, okay? Mm -hmm. So, your favorite movie? 
my favorite. Oh, movie. Oh, shoot. Well, we don't go to movies much anymore. I I don't know. I, I used to like, um, oh, Death Wish. <laughs> <laughs> Death Wish. I watched several of the Death Wish movies with that crazy looker guy. Um, what was his name? I don't know. I have to look that one up. Death Wish. Yeah, he's a, he's a guy. He's the guy who lived uh, out in South Woodstock later on. Oh, yeah, and Lou was on an airplane with him. Charles Bronson. Charles Bronson. Yeah, he made several movies, and in each case, there were movies where he it were involved guns, okay. and his wife his wife had been brutally murdered, and uh, in the movie the movie is all about how he. He went and went into all kinds of disguised things and went into the cities and mingled with these mobsters and so forth. Okay. So he found all the ones who had, had killed his wife, and he killed them all. Okay. Well, this is our lightning round. We'll go look up. We'll, oh, we'll watch that Death Wish together. That was much lightning. <laughs> <laughs> what are your favorite colors? Blue. Blue. Okay. Your favorite place to visit? Well, I was thinking about that the other night. Countries-wise, I, I love I love Switzerland and Austria. Okay. And and New Zealand. Yeah, I know. I think New Zealand yeah. is where you wanted to move the whole family, but that's just too far to go. <laughs> where was yeah. the favorite place you've lived of all the homes? Uh, probably the one over on uh, Lake Tarpon, across from Innisbrook, the one that you found for us. Yeah. Yeah, that was, that was nice. We had the two dogs, and we had a, our own little, little pond within our own alligator. And then just a couple hundred yards down the road was our had our little boat in a big lake. Okay. And then we were only five minutes away from the golf course, and uh, I was retired by then. So okay. So it, uh, it was a great place. What's your favorite golf course? Oh, dear. Well... This is tough for a golfer. Yeah, I've been to so many. Um, my favorite golf course. Uh, dude, that's hard to say, hon. Okay. There's so many in Scotland, but most Scottish golf courses are pretty much the same. And uh, so I, I would, I love any of those. And fortunately, I've been there a couple of times. And you've had, what, eight hole-in-ones? Yeah, eight hole-in-ones. Which was your most favorite? favorite or most fun to think about uh well, let's see i mean they're exciting anyway but to have eight of them there's got to be one that might have stood out uh, probably well probably the first one the first one was on a 13th hole at uh, woodstock and i was playing with my buddies doc, dr roberts and wendell barwood and uh, it's funny that I remember that hole because I can even remember the ball that I used and the iron that I hit. And for those who are golfers, to think of those, remember those things for over 60 years is pretty unusual. You have but, the most incredible memory as far as golf goes. And I think that was in your book, Swing yep. and Sway with Dr. J. Yeah. Uh -huh. That it, yeah. Got any golfers listening, contact us because that book is amazing. He, he remembers everything. Where me, I try to forget my golf game as soon as I walk <laughs> off the green. Oh, yeah. I, I, I can remember almost every, every shot I ever had. It was of any importance. And uh, I think sometimes you remember some of the things that I said. Unbelievable, you know, Dad. It is crazy, and yet you have some days I can't remember where I put my glasses. <laughs> or where what's your I put your mother. <laughs> what's your favorite animal? Uh, well, my favorite animal, I think, would be a Siberian tiger, okay. besides golden retrievers. I love golden retrievers to death, but as far as a wild animal goes, I think uh, big Siberian tigers are just so gorgeous. And I know you love golden retrievers. You also wrote a book about golden retrievers called My 50 Golden Years, which was, I think, a book that when we start talking about genealogy years ago, I wanted you to write a book about the family. I said, Dad, just write a book. We got so much information about the Butts family. And he ended up writing a book about the dogs 
but threw in the family history. Uh -huh. So, which can you have a favorite? It's like asking who your favorite child is. Can you have a favorite pet of all the Goldens? Who was your favorite? Yeah, yeah, I think so. <clears throat> Our last two Goldens were twins, <clears throat> Angel, Princess, Angel, Princess, and Prince. The male. They were they were twins, brother and sister, and uh, <clears throat> they were the last ones that we had. And Angel was such a sweet dog. Of course, all golden retrievers are sweet, but it'd be, she just used to love to. I'd sit on a sofa, and she just loved to get up and sit next to me and lean on me, and start making all these little noises. <laughs> you know, just very faint. But it was just I just loved her to death. Of all the we had ten dogs. Of all the dogs that we had to put away, she's the only one that caused me to cry some. And I'm I'm not a person who cries very much and uh, never did. And that that really bothers me to think that she died when she was only half age she should have been normally. She died at age six. And she also died from melanoma, which is the one thing that nearly killed me 10, 15, 15 years ago. So You've survived how many melanomas? Eight? Uh, yeah, eight. Same okay. number of whole ones. <laughs> Dang, Dad. Yeah, that's a lot. In fact, I had so many of them that the last one of the doctors that took off the one of them uh, asked me if I would mind speaking to the hospital that he uh, worked at. If I would, they have a little uh, thing where they have discussions about different things and invite doctors to talk. He invited, he invited me to talk about uh, Mel being a melanoma survivor which I, I had done that several times. And then it, even in my book, even in the dog book, I devoted a chapter to uh, melanomas and what to be careful of with melanomas and so forth. There's something, and actually we've just had that in the family. One of our extended family members had it, um, just lost an eye due to yep. melanoma. So when you, I don't recall when you got your first, and I'm thinking about this only because we've had, I have so many pictures of you and mom traveling around the world um, um, out in the sun. And I recall as a little girl, you would be out in the sun. Now, we grew up in Vermont, so the period of time we were out in the sun was short, but you were always so dark in the summer. You know, it was like yeah. you, you were almost black-skinned in the summer. And um, so that's come back literally to bite you. So yeah, how, did, how did you get your – how did they find the first one? The first melanoma I had was uh, after I had retired, because I retired early. I was 57. But anyway, um, I went out, and we were living over in Florida on the, on the Gulf. And I just went in for my first ever, as I recall, skin check, because we just didn't do skin checks in those days. And I went over there, um, and the guy said, okay, you've got a... A squamous cell, a basal cell, and a melanoma. Well, it, it didn't strike me at the time that that's pretty unusual. The first thing I thought about was this guy's just trying to make a lot of money off of me. But anyway, they, they said he took off a, a melanoma on my back. Well, of course, it was right in the middle of my back, and there was no way that I could see it. Uh, so I had to take his word for it. It couldn't have been too big. But that's the first melanoma that I'd ever had. Now, I think, I can't recall exactly the sequence, but John had, a, our son John, oldest son, uh, had a melanoma uh, up in Vermont when he was up there as a, as a state police lifeguard. Mm -hmm. And he had a melanoma removed on his neck, but it had been like a mole. So it had been there for years. It just changed, which is what melanomas can do. So anyway, that was the first one in the family. But then I had this one. And then I think the next one that I had was the one I had up at Mayo Clinic where Mom had noticed this thing on my arm. And uh, I, I more or less looked around and kept an eye out for unusual skin lesions. But I hadn't noticed this one in particular because I got so many bruises and other things, um, not from your mom. And um, so anyway, I, I went to the Mayo Clinic at the time, which we were going to in Jacksonville, Florida, and uh, went in there, and they 
they looked at it and they said, yep. And they, they gave me a, a exam and they even went up and uh, took out my lymph clothes and my armpit, which are the first line of defense for things like melanomas. If you have one, it'll spread up your arm to the, to the lymph nodes and the lymph nodes will catch it at least for a while, and if it's there too long, then it spreads to there, and then you're, you don't last for a few months. That's why melanomas can be very quick acting. You can die from melanoma in, in 60 days, and we've had friends who did exactly that. But anyway, um, we saw it when they were up there, and they, they did this fantastic. The surgery, I must have had 50 stitches in this thing. It was the size of your fingernail. I mean, it wasn't very big, but it went what they call 1.98 millimeters depth, and they consider two millimeters the turning point between whether you make it or not. It goes beyond two millimeters deep in your skin, and it'll spread so fast that you don't have a chance. It usually goes to your brain or your lungs. So... Well, I re I remember that one because my kids were little and I was I was here in Florida, and that was the one time I would I would go drop the kids off at school and go to the beach and I just sat there, probably did a lot of crying, but I sat there and I just watched the water, oh, yeah. you know, coming into the into the shore, um, because I knew that was one of your favorite places too, and uh, yeah. boy that it seemed like yesterday that that we used to do that and honestly you know once you survived that, which was wonderful. I don't spend a lot of time at the beach. <laughs> Not sure. Yeah. That was good. To, well, but it's funny. I used to love to be in the sun so much, partly because as a teenage kid, I had, you know, acne a bit, and it bothered me. And I used to try on I knew that sunlight was supposed to be good for it. I never even thought about skin cancer. Mm -hmm. And I would lay out in the sun, even when I lived in the city. Any time I had a chance, I would lay on the sun to study or whatever. It was ridiculous, but I, I did. And in fact, in those days, we used to even buy sun lamps, ultra, you know, infrared sunlamps or ultraviolet, ultraviolet sun lamps, and lay under them to get the tan. In fact, one of the girls in my high school class fell asleep under the under the darn thing and ended up with third degree burns. Yeah, that can be a that can be a problem. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, let's move on real quick. When you uh, grandpa died, you went to Penn, and how did you pay for school? Yeah, that's an interesting question because I, I've been thinking about that for the last couple of years. I said, first of all, we had no insurance to speak of, ten thousand dollars, which is not very much. And University of Pennsylvania, of course, is one of the top schools in the world as far as that goes. And it's very expensive. It was expensive in 1950s also, <laughs> but even before that. And uh, I, I worked, I just worked so many different places and jobs. And I never thought about it because it was my normal life. I started working on when I was uh, 17. I worked at a grocery store for a whole year before I went to college. But anyway, um, I don't know, Deb. I, I, I did get a small scholarship from uh, the Atlantic Refining Oil Company, but that was about all. And then the other thing, which was almost the thing that made a difference, was when I was in high school. I was I was an average student. I, I just played so much athletics, so I guess I took too much time with that. But anyway, uh, I would not be a great. I was not a great student. I don't know, but I didn't spend enough time with it, I guess. But anyway, I used to be, when I took tests, I took a test for the, the Navy, U.S. Navy, ROTC. Mm -hmm. They gave a test at all the high schools. And our high school was a big one. We had 2,000 kids in our high school. And I took tests there. And uh, I, and surprisingly, my brother-in-law-to-be, he and I both got full scholarships in the Navy ROTC and a full scholarship meant that you you could go to any college, any place, and you get four years of tuition plus so much money a month and so forth. And all you had to do was serve four years in the Navy after you got out of school, which was a fantastic deal. But when I was a 12-year-old, I had injured my eye playing baseball. I got hit right in the eye with a ball. 
and I had a scar, tore my retina, I had a scar on it. Scar healed, but it never went away, and it's still there. Been there since uh, I was 12 years old. And so anyway, um, I went in to have a check physical for my scholarship at the Navy Yard in Philadelphia, and the guy says, uh, what's this on your eye? I said, that's where I got hit by the baseball. And he said, well, you know, it, it's a scar, and you know that. He said, do you mind if I take a picture of it? Because he hadn't seen one like it before. I said, yeah. So anyway, then we're, we're done that, and he looked at me and he says, I'm sorry, son. He says, but because of that, you, you cannot qualify for the scholarship. Mm-hmm. So there, one little crazy incident at the grade school playground cost me a fortune. <laughs> So anyway, I don't know. I had I had jobs forever, and I used to do a lot of photography work, and I'd sell pictures to people and do weddings and stuff like that. And I sold almost everything I owned, as I said, my guns, my stamp collections, anything I had that was any value at all. But it's okay. Did I I missed them at the time, but didn't take any of it. Well, so anyway, was- I, I don't know how I paid for it otherwise. That's uh, interesting. I, yeah, I had a little little idea that perhaps my dad's brother, who Uncle Al, who was a, a physician, and uh, he had no children, and he was like a second father to me in many ways. And uh, it's possible, although I never found out if he did anything, whether he helped my mom pay for that or not, okay. because there's no way I could have made that much money. You know, four years of University of Pennsylvania is got to be millions of dollars. It's just, it's just, I'm not that much, but in those days, but certainly several hundred thousand dollars at least. And how did I do it? I don't know, but I, I walked away from my last graduation. I did no nickel, and I went right into the Air Force because I didn't amazing. have any money. <laughs> <laughs> uh, while you were growing up, Dad, you said you mentioned earlier that you loved sports. What were your favorite sports and the ones that you played? Yeah, well, sports is funny. I used to feel like, as far as sports go, I wasn't the best, particularly in any one sport, better than anybody else. But I could compete with anybody in any sport. It didn't matter what it was. But basketball, I played a lot of basketball. I played basketball until I was 45 years old competitively. And um, then, of course, soccer I played since I was in grade school, and I played for Penn on the soccer team. But basketball is one of my favorites, and I didn't get into golf and tennis until I was after college. And uh, I was pretty, pretty active in both of those, and if I do say so myself, I did pretty well with both of those. Well, and uh, being slightly competitive is a... Is, uh... I just lost the word for it, but you're not slightly competitive. You, as the rest of the family, are very competitive. <laughs> Everything, <laughs> even ping yeah. pong. Um, all right, so Pop, the quick question: What was the most trouble you've ever gotten into? Most trouble? <laughs> well, seems ridiculous, but I, I haven't been in much trouble. But uh, <laughs> the only thing I did do, and I still recall. When I was a kid, we had a neighbor who was kind of nasty, an old couple of cranky old people lived two houses away. And uh, one time when it was, what do they call it, Halloween, mm-hmm. it was trick-or-treat or trick or night, uh, I and another kid went up to their house after dark. And this is, this is during the Second World War. And we went up after dark, and we took chalk, and we, we drew on the on the people's front steps <laughs> anyway uh, you get the in trouble? Next day, yeah the next day a, a big policeman arrives at my door at the house and of course I'd never seen a policeman before <laughs> he's not up close he said uh, son do you do you know anything about these markings and so forth up the street and blah 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 and uh, he said uh, Yes, I do. <laughs> he said, you did that? And I said, yes, sir. So anyway, he said, okay. He said, I just want to know if you're done. And I said, I want you to get up there right now and clean them up. 
<laughs> so off I went, and I scrubbed them all off the people's house, and that was the end of that. I don't remember anything else, hon. <laughs> well, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it is. Well, one thing I regret of, of everything about my, my pop was that he never, unfortunately, lived long enough. If he had lived another six months, he would have met your mom, but he never did. And he also would have uh, never did uh, know how you guys succeeded in your lives as you have. Uh, he would be so proud of, of all four of your kids and, of course, mom. And, uh, but that never happened. So it didn't, ha didn't happen in person, but I know, I know he knows it. Did he ever express to you, though, how proud he was of you? Or was he just quiet? No, I don't think so. He was very quiet. Yeah, we, we didn't talk a lot. That's another thing that bothered me over the years later. I said, you know, I never sat down with my dad and talked about much. He, he was just so quiet. And uh, even whenever we did things, it was like you go fishing. Well, we'd go fishing. You don't talk that much if you're mm -hmm. 100 yards apart in the ocean. And when I was out shooting, we were too busy shooting to talk and uh he used to he used to read voraciously he he would read a book a week and uh, so he was constantly taking up his time with that and of course i was in school most of the time and he's going to work so it was kind of sad but it just didn't happen okay well it was a different time back then at this point in the show we're going to take a short break and this will continue in part two this is so much fun to speak with my father, Dr. Jack, an hour with the guy that's most important in my life. Back soon. Thank you for listening to Stand Up and Speak Up. We are dedicated to encouraging you to remove the mask of embarrassment and to being your best self. If you are the victim of a scam or cybercrime, please visit againstscams.org for assistance and guidance about options and recovery. SCARS, the Society of Citizens Against Relationship Scams, is an incorporated nonprofit crime victims assistance organization based in Miami, Florida, supporting scam victims worldwide. If you can, make a small donation to help victims around the world receive the help they need. This episode has been sponsored by BenfoComplete.com, a vitamin supplement company that supports happy and healthy hands and feet for those with neuropathy. If you or anyone you know struggles with the pins and needles or numbness in their hands and feet, check out our Benfotemian products at BenfoComplete.com. Use the special code STANDUP for a 5% discount on your purchase. Again, thank you for being with us today. Go to my website, The Woman Behind the Smile, for additional resources and information. Subscribe to my YouTube channel and enjoy the replays. My books are all available on Amazon.com and Audible, and I encourage you to join us again. Have a great day.